All right, welcome everyone. It's uh, me, Seem, and uh, my wife, Inka. We are doing like a podcast and like a talk show thing right now. We'll just you know try it out and see how it goes. We'll just cover different kinds of topics related to some scientific studies and some other findings that we've uh, discovered recently and uh, just talk about different topics. Do you want to look and feel younger? If you do, I'm looking for a few more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, message me on Instagram the word health and I'll send you the details or send me an email to seem at seamland.com. So let's start with like a few updates of um, what we've been up to. So like what have you done over the last few weeks or so mm. you can share with people? Mm. Well, uh, I've been up- updating the Instagram, new content. Um, uh, we've been traveling, we, we came back recently from the travels, so just settling to home and writing a, a book. have been done quite a lot of research on brain health mm-hmm. recently, the past few weeks. Yeah, it's a, mm-hmm. like the common book we're co-authoring together, it's probably like comes out next year, something like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I also uh, started writing... A new book uh, with Dr. James and it's going to be about collagen and glycine which has been very uh, interesting and exciting <laughs> so glycine is my favorite supplements and uh, yeah Usually like he eats it a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean it's uh, I mean many benefits to it like it can help with uh, glutathione it can help with uh, inflammation collagen uh, skin health uh, anti-aging sleep and insulin sensitivity so many things so yeah, I think it's a uh, one of the best supplements and the one thing that I did discover so far already was that uh, glycine is actually one of the first or it's essentially yeah, like the first amino acids on earth that uh, created life <laughs> and uh, in a, like you know 3.8 billion years ago when earth was like this big boiling soup uh, then uh, there wasn't you know, like any possibility for uh, life but um, the like occur- appearance of glycine on Earth enabled the first life forms to develop. So these like chlorella and these algae type uh, life forms, and they used glycine to pretty much survive in like ho- high salt environments, high temperature environments. So yeah, glycine is one of the like initial creators of uh, life forms. And um, the funny thing about how glycine got to Earth was that it came on Earth on comets. So meteorites that were bombarding Earth uh, a lot, then uh, the meteorite ice or asteroid ice on there, uh, pretty much uh, like UV radiation from the sun on top of the ice inside comets created glycine as well as the impact on Earth. So if uh, the comets landed on earth then uh, that impact also created glycine so that's how glycine got on earth <laughs> and uh, created life which is like a very funny uh, hollywood uh, hollywood movie plot almost but uh, yeah the book itself is gonna talk a lot about all the benefits of glycine and collagen uh, which we've actually been eating a lot as well collagen recently yeah collagen and actually i didn't eat much glycine before you mm. know we got together and you know, you started feeding it to me at the beginning. <laughs> and I was Which like, cool. well, yeah, what is this glycine? And uh, I noticed a lot of benefits, especially if I take it high doses, like three grams in the evening. Mm-hmm. It really helps with the sleep. But I think also with the skin benefits and it's mm-hmm. like joint benefits. Well, I've done a lot for my joints recently mm-hmm. uh, because I had the knee injury last year. But I think the glycine really helps with that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and uh, co- collagen as well. Yeah, collagen. I've like re- looked into more of the studies about collagen as well, and mm. uh, it's actually pretty good for anti-aging in terms of the wrinkles and the skin elasticity and things like that. But obviously, yeah, the bones and tendons and ligaments as well. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, also for the brain, mm. like the brain health aspect was totally new for me in terms of collagen. Mm-hmm. And then I was talking with the guys from Do Not Do Not Age. And um, they told me that, you know, collagen is also for the brain. Hmm. And I started looking into the studies. There are not that much. It's not like a huge literature. But there are, it does contribute to the gray matter density in the Hmm. brain. And there was some benefits of speeding up the recovery from brain injury. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. 
And of course, the cardiovascular benefits of the blood vessels, the lining is made of collagen. Yeah, and one of the benefits for the brain was, or they thought that it's mediated by, you know, improving the blood vessels. Mm. So, yeah. Microcirculation as well, probably then. Yeah, yeah. And one um, important point about this, I guess, is that, yeah, like you, your body can make glycine as well as uh, collagen, but uh, the amounts are quite small. So like mm. for optimal health, you probably need a lot more. And uh, yeah, uh, we take quite a lot. We take like maybe 10 grams or more even. Uh, plus we eat a lot of like glycine rich foods. Mm. But uh, I think they yeah, underestimated how much glycine you actually need because yeah, glycine is for collagen turnover, but also for creatine and glutathione and heme production. And uh, if you're yeah, like so like you you produce three grams of glycine per day endogenously, so your body makes it. Mm. And uh, to make glutathione and creatine and heme, that also takes maybe three grams. But for collagen turnover, daily collagen turnover is like 12 grams of glycine. Mm. So uh, you may need like, you know, 15 grams of glycine. And if your body only makes three and you're not really getting that much from diet, then yeah, you definitely need like 10 grams at least. Yeah, probably in the countries where they eat a lot of broth and joints, like Asian countries, they get a lot mm. more collagen for the diet. Mm. And they tend to have very good skin as well. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah. Mm. So like pork legs and mm -hmm. pork actually pork skin is very high in well, yeah, the I highest mean, source of uh, glycine from foods yeah when i was in china the the women uh, really ate a lot of the pork skin and the mm. pork legs and encouraged me to eat as well they were like literally saying that you need to eat this for for beauty and health <laughs> and yeah. yeah but the we also like to do the jello yeah jello is jello uh, just jello gelatin powder and you make the jello with it. Yeah. That's also a very high source of glycine and collagen. Yeah. Um, so uh, you actually also, from the researching for the brain book, mm -hmm. you uh, discovered a very interesting article about the Okinawans. So can you talk yeah. a little about it? Yeah, that was super interesting. So um, basically, as a background, I've been doing or uh, writing the chapter on on like insulin and diets and yeah the calorie restriction and ketogenic and just looking into like what actually seems to mediate brain longevity what, what evidence there are and of course when to look into the centenarians in okinawa as well and like blue zones and why they live long what was in their diet and there was this good article uh, from already 2009 actually mm -hmm. about uh, what can we learn from the Okinawans and uh, I guess the main point there was they talked about the calorie restriction but all the other things as well that Okinawans had in their diet at uh, the traditional Okinawa per se so like the modern Okinawa is not anymore the longevity diet but mm. it was the traditional pre-world war ii diet so right now they're not living as long no the Okinawans. <laughs> no yeah, it's. Um, I think they even told that we, we need to check it, but like they have now way higher rates of obesity, even in childhood obesity. They have like um, more heart disease or diabetes than in mainland Japan. So it was because during World War Two, all the American influence came into the diet. Mm -hmm. or probably like one, probably there were a lot of things that happened after the World War, or uh, but. Like that was one of the things that really radically shifted from compared to pre-war. Mm. What kind of changes then? The major changes? There were like many changes, but one thing that in terms of, for example, the um, calories, that was quite significant. So pre-war, you know, as a background, calorie restriction has calorie restriction has been studied quite a lot in the past decades or at least a decade and shown longevity benefits um, and that was one thing that the Okinawans had like they were estimated to be about 200 calorie deficit compared mm. to the average daily need which was around 750 mm. and they were getting 200 calories less and after the war they were getting 200 calories more mm. 
which was comparable to what Americans were eating at the time. So they were like, at the time, 1970, they compared it to that time, they were about 200 calorie surplus. Mm. So then they were, in terms of calories, the Okinawans and Americans became similar. Mm. That's not actually a lot. That's a very small <laughs> surplus, yeah. uh, but it apparently has a huge impact. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, there was also other things, but, you know, deficit, calorie deficit or calorie surplus. I mean, from calorie surplus, you would start gaining weight. Mm. Anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, like messes up the biomarkers a bit. Mm. So more diabetes, more uh, more uh, hypertension, other, other like these uh, diseases. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, like the calorie restriction is pretty uh, across all species generally associated with longevity and uh, increased lifespan. Uh, but uh, there's no like h- human specific studies that look at it. But obviously this is an example of it that uh, yeah, excess calorie consumption is definitely not uh, the most optimal thing. And it goes like, you know, this, you know, during the war, it was probably like they had food rationing or um, shortages of food, which created the calorie deficit. And uh, yeah, like this uh, short term starvation periods or food shortages are actually uh, beneficial. That's how calorie restriction works, that the body is under this small energy stress and uh, turns on these longevity pathways and reduces inflammation and uh, yeah, loses weight, that kind of thing. And when you get out of that starvation state or you go into like a more higher calorie consumption, you go into more like comfortable lifestyle and food abundance which is the American lifestyle kind of represents, then, uh, yeah, you, the opposite. You uh, shorten the lifespan and get sicker faster. So it's kind of pretty, I think it's pretty simple idea and uh, pretty uh, many examples of that that represent it. Mm. Yeah, but then there was this study of the Minnesota starvation experiment, which showed that if it's too long, or if the calorie restriction is very poorly designed, it doesn't have any benefits at all. Or at least, well, they didn't look at the, of course, they couldn't do it for a long time. They couldn't mm. see the longevity or whatever. And um, they didn't have ba- brain scans and stuff like that at the time. Um, but, you know, the, the there is this uh, big book about this whole experiment. And that was six months calorie restriction to young American healthy, physically active men, which was only like about, so they were eating in a normal conditions, they were eating or in the control period before the experiment about, it was over 3000 calories. Mm. And then they entered into the starvation, which was actually only 1500 calories but for six months. But their di- but the diet composition was like a representative of the average diet in Europe at the time. So it was very high in potatoes and bread and porridge and stuff like that. So high carb, no nutrients, no not much, much veggies or meat or salt or anything like that. And they actually got pretty poor outcomes. So the people lost 25% of their weight, mm-hmm. the men. Uh, 20% of which was muscle mass. Mm. And then they felt fatigued. They had brain fog, chronic like or, or gut issues. They had low mood, even suicidal thoughts. Mm. So it was pretty harsh yeah. you I know, remember, outcome. I, actually, yeah. I remember some of them had like uh, dreams of like eating the other subject in the study <laughs> or something. Okay. Like that. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, maybe I'm making it up. But uh, yeah, like, you know, it's a very... I mean, it's not actually like a very severe calorie restriction, like 1500 calories, but they were also like just doing a lot of physical labor and they didn't get Mm -hmm. like protein, which I think was the biggest reason for their like deterioration uh, in such a rapid way. Well, at least the muscle. Yeah. But for example, in the Okinawan diet, so here we go into the like the diet composition, Mm. is that the Okinawans weren't getting protein either, Mm. but they had very good outcomes still. Mm-hmm. But they were eating a lot of like um, vegetables. It was mm. a vegetable-based diet, so a lot of vegetables, green beans, okra, bok choy. I don't know what were available at the time, but a lot of uh, fresh vegetables. They were eating miso, 
um, sweet potato was their stable food. Mm -hmm. Stable food, whereas in mainland Japan it was rice, mm -hmm. and many Asian countries it's rice. Mm -hmm. But it was sweet potato, which is of course high in vitamin A and vitamin C and um, potassium and iron and those things. So like the vitamins and minerals were definitely present in the diet, even though it lacked to protein. There was this, um, in the article, there is the table of the content of carbs, fats and proteins. Maybe we can, I can share look it up. up. So this is the article, uh, the Okinawan diet, healthy implications of a low calorie, nutrient dense, antioxidant rich dietary pattern, low in glycemic load. Mm. And where we can scroll to the food. Yeah, it's lower, even lower. Uh, so we, I, this is the mortality rates from yeah. coronary heart disease and cancer. So um, Americans, super high. <laughs> and uh, Okinawans, the lowest. Mm, this is the food pyramid, mm. right? So lots of vegetables, fruits, legumes, low GI grains, fish and lean meats, oils, herbs, spices, sweets, and alcohol in moderation. Where is physical activity in the food pyramid? <laughs> well, I mean, this is a uh, supporter of the mm. pyramid. Like, it's not a part of the pyramid, I guess. But um, rich in omega-3 fats, high mono unsaturated to saturated fat ratio, and emphasis on low glycemic index carbohydrates. And that's the staple food. Like, uh, they had a big shift in this uh, glycemic load of the diet when they shifted from sweet potato to rice after the war. Because pre-war actually sweet potato or like sweet potato has in those countries been um, considered as sort of like the poor people food. Mm. <laughs> and the rice was the royalty food. <laughs> so they switched <laughs> into the royalty food. Yeah, interesting. I mean, sweet potatoes are definitely more nutrient dense than rice. So rice doesn't have any like micronutrients really. Yeah. But it's interesting. So this one, it was very interesting. So the traditional Okinawa in this table on the left side is the one that is associated with all the longevity and health benefits. So they had pretty high diet in carbohydrates. And that made them... 85 is very high, yeah. Yeah, and not that much protein. Mm -hmm. It's 9% protein. Fat was also very low, 6%. And saturated fat was very, very low. Mm-hmm. It has quite a lot of sodium, though, but they, they thought that it was like at a miso and... Well, 1000 milligrams is uh, below the RDA for ah, okay. US right now. So, ah, okay, so yeah. 2500 is usually the recommended amount. Oh, yeah, so it should be in higher. Yeah, technically, yeah, but they get so much potassium that uh, they probably don't need that much sodium. And they're eating mm. so many carbs, so their sodium requirement kind of goes down. Mm. And so yeah, this this was interesting that they actually didn't get that much protein, but I don't think they were very muscular either at the time, <laughs> yeah. and you know they weren't very big. So for example, this caloric needs that they or the calories that they were getting seven hundred seventeen hundred fifty is like probably a standard American at the time needs more, mm. but it's estimated that it's over uh, thirty five hundred that they get. Yeah. So probably that's a bit too high. I mean, they probably don't need that much. Yeah. So in the modern diet, modern Okinawa diet, more fat and more protein, less carbs. Yeah, like four times more fat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty high. A lot more sodium and a lot less potassium. Which probably just comes from the swapping to processed foods. So their protein intake is still very low uh, compared to like standards. But they get a lot more fat which probably means that they're eating more like processed packaged uh, foods uh, so that more sodium as well and less potassium less whole food carbs more uh, processed uh, carbs mm. yeah and um, apparently more dairy that they didn't have almost at all mm. yeah. before the war and then now they are also having dairy products there yeah and they also suspected that um, like the low protein is not necessarily the key, but the fact that, you know, if the protein is very low quality, mm. it's like very processed 
form or like this kind of inflammatory protein like uh too Processed high in meat, yeah. yeah too high in you know bcaas or something not balanced mm. and too high in methionine yeah you know, that, then then it wouldn't really be healthy to yeah. put in the diet yeah so the methionine glycine balance is also one of the part of the reason why calorie restriction helps with longevity uh so um essentially like too much methionine which you get from muscle meats and uh yeah, like dairy is uh, toxic to the body and it can like raise homocysteine levels and it can yeah, shorten lifespan and promote cancer growth. Whereas if you get like protein restriction, less methionine then and more glycine, then um, it's better for longevity. So glycine does like reduces methionine toxicity and reduces homocysteine, reduces inflammation and and uh, yeah it's better overall mm. so you need to eat more of these again <laughs> less muscle meat and more um these tendons and uh ligaments and those kind of things yeah and they have like fish mm-hmm. i mean lean fish and lean meat is or even salmon mm-hmm. and lean meats are like good proteins yeah i mean and you know when uh people are so protein is also like an abundance food Mm. So rich countries eat more protein because they have because protein is more expensive and they have access to it more, which makes them obtain more methionine and then age just them faster. Whereas poorer countries, or like during war, for example, you have less protein access and availability, and uh, yeah, you get less methionine and the protein restriction still helps you to live longer or reduces the disease risk mm. that you get. Um, so yeah, I guess the main takeaway from this the protein side is to yeah eat more glycine and uh, <laughs> eat less <laughs> methionine <laughs> eat all the glycine <laughs> yes and um yeah do, um, i mean I, i'm pretty sure the okinawans eat pork but they eat the pork legs so they eat like the collagen and the glycine from there not not the not the steaks not the tomahawks and uh that kind of thing yeah and also the the pork is sort of like in the side dishes and it's like a little pieces of pork in the veggies yeah, or something it's in, not in they the don't eat big steaks yeah that's kind of very rice actually, or whatever yeah and that's kind of a very new thing the steaks so like even 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 me like i mean i'm a 90s kid mm-hmm. and uh, m- like my family they wasn't like super uh, we weren't like wealthy we were kind of uh yeah like a teacher and uh <laughs> policeman uh, parents so uh, we didn't have like yeah a lot of meat all the time. We did eat like plenty of meat, but yeah, it was in the in the food mixed together like in stews and uh, mm. minced meat and like cheap meats uh, instead of steaks. So, like we never ate steaks. <laughs> like we mm. ne- we never ate uh, like a beef uh, t bone or steak or anything of like that. Whereas nowadays you can get it anywhere and it's pretty cheap. Or I mean, it's not cheap, but it's much more easily accessible uh, than uh, even twenty years ago. Mm. So uh, that definitely can also contribute. So people are eating too much protein, which accelerates their aging. Yeah. Uh, and specifically too much methionine. So they need more of these uh, collagen and tendinous parts with uh, glycine. And like in all the Mediterranean type diet, you know, mind diet and DASH diet that are the mostly linked to the longevity benefits, they don't eat a lot of red meat. So... It's necessarily not about even the the parts of the meat that you eat, but it's the type of the meat. Do you eat white meat or red meat mm-hmm. or lean meat or fatty, you know, pork meat? So it's like, um, you know, fish is meat or fish is, you know, they, yeah. they just eat a lot of seafood. And for example, in the mind diet, which is the anti-Alzheimer's diet, so to speak, um, meat is only part of the diet like once a week. Mm. or twice a week as fish is three times a week Mm. and the main source of protein is always the legumes beans lentils the plant proteins so interesting yeah yeah so So, i mean i guess many people would think you know when they think about protein they just think about meat mm. you know is it you know pork or beef or grass-fed or whatever Mm. uh, wild herb fed i mean maybe that's not the point maybe it's actually the what's the source of the protein in the first place yeah and uh there is a difference between plant-based protein and animal-based protein 
So yeah, animal-based protein is very high in methionine. Plant-based proteins are less in methionine. They have a bit more glycine. And um, the BCA difference as well. So animal protein has a lot of BCAs. Leucine specifically that helps mm-hmm. with protein synthesis. So yeah, like animal protein is superior for muscle growth and, uh, and turning on protein synthesis and mTOR stimulation. But that's not always the best for longevity because of yeah, excess methionine, excess mTOR stimulation. And also BCA- calories generally. So uh, yeah, and BCAAs actually prevent, for example, tryptophan to access the brain because mm. there's too much these com- competitive large neutral amino acids in the bloodstream. The tryptophan loses the access to the brain, so that would mean less serotonin production in the brain, mm. maybe poorer sleep, maybe poorer mood, and actually less brain growth because serotonin is, you know, the the hippocampus is very abundant in serotonergic receptors and mm. serotonin production. So it's also that then it's the the balance of the neurotransmitter might switch a little bit. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the I guess the point isn't to like avoid all meat or something but the point is to yeah increase your methionine to glycine ratio and um glycine to methionine mm. yeah either way <laughs> so yeah more more glycine less methionine and um i mean incorporating some so glycine is also actually the um anti catabolic so glycine helps to preserve muscle so even if you are eating a low bca diet you may not build as much muscle, but if you get enough protein, even from glycine, then you will still maintain it. Mm. And likewise with collagen. So collagen isn't going to make you build muscle because it doesn't have leucine, but uh, it does help to preserve muscle. Mm. So from a longevity side, then you just need to make sure that you get like a certain threshold of protein, not necessarily super high protein. And uh, make for longevity protein, then it has to be lower in methionine and... Um, higher in glycine uh, or at least you need to cycle them so you need to have periods of higher methionine intake and periods of higher glycine and collagen intake mm. so like you know there is no like i guess golden rule how much methionine or how much like glycine or how much animal versus how much plant-based protein um, but you need to like yeah find some sort of a balance of cycling with them and uh, incorporating either glycine as a supplement if you're eating a lot of muscle meat or uh, swapping some of the muscle meat which i think is a good idea with more of these collagen proteins Mm, plant proteins as well yeah yeah and uh, adding glycine as a supplement Mm, yeah for me i've noticed it's like just personally works quite well that i eat like i don't eat a lot of red meat so i eat a lot of fish Mm. white fish I eat chicken every now and then, and then very little red meat. Mm. And then I eat the organs, so mm. like liver and Micro tongue. And, yeah. And then I eat a lot of beans as well, and chickpeas, and mm. uh, new zest, and <laughs> plant protein powders, and crump. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good, good uh, alternatives. But let's talk about... What is the kind of DASH diet that they compare here? Mm-hmm. You know about it. Well, that's actually... I don't know that much about DASH. I know more about oh, the sorry. Mediterranean and mind. Okay. <laughs> so this is the... Uh, like for uh, reducing blood pressure. Mm. This is the hypertension diet. Mm-hmm. Which is linked to yeah better cardiovascular health. And especially if you have chronically high blood pressure or something. Then... They recommend the DASH diet, but I haven't looked into it a lot. Mm, I mean, I, I would imagine it's pretty similar to the Mediterranean diet. So uh... Yeah, they are pretty similar, but I don't know the specific foods in DASH. I guess the main point there is actually to restrict salt. Mm-hmm. That's the main point in the DASH diet. Mediterranean diet is more based, similar to the Okinawan diet. So the Mediterranean diet, the main main proteins would come for from plant sources and fish mm-hmm. it's pretty um low in um like uh, wait let me look at the values they're pretty high in fat mm, i mean it's the olive oil and 
Yeah, I mean, olive oil is amazing. So also the quality of the fat, I would think, matter a lot. I think the modern Okinawa, for example, you can see that the ratio, or like the saturated fat from the pre-war Okinawa actually elevated three times. Mm-hmm. So that would indicate that the plant, that the fat source is definitely not olive oil or mm. plant oils, like these healthy avocado oils or something like that that they increased, it's actually probably coming from these more fattier pieces of meat. Or trans fats. Or trans fats, yeah. Yes. What else do they have here? So this does the sweet potato. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so ah. the staple food was, you can see that in the pre-war Okinawa, it was definitely sweet potato. Yeah. And then the consumption of rice increased. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And bread as well. Bread has been steadily increasing. Yeah. So that's the American influence, the white bread. And I guess it's also about the, the cost. Is, mm. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's cheaper. Interesting that sweet potatoes were so large. I mean, maybe sweet sweet potatoes do have some good... Like the main mac- micronutrient is like just potassium. Mm. But it also has like resistant starch, which... Is like just more fibrous and uh, helps with the blood sugar balance more. And, and it's it, also very high in vitamin A. Yes. And see, so also iron, mm. iron content. Mm. Oh, here is the uh, it's a sweet, sweet potato. potato. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, A and C, vitamin C. Actually, mm. thinking about changing that amount of, if you get 50% of the vitamin C. Per, is it the 100, 180 grams? Mm-hmm. So you get that much vitamin C, so that would be what, 100 milligram. Mm. And then you just erase that daily intake yes. and you, yeah, mm, replace that with a rice. Mm. Probably not be the most optimal solution if you are on a calorie restricted. And I think this we need to take into consideration that, you know, these nutrients are very good if you are calorie restricted. Yeah, and uh, the the glycemic index sweet potatoes have also the lowest glycemic index compared to other types of potatoes. Uh, but I, I mean, I personally like still regular potatoes as well. So like regular white potatoes are still amazing uh, source of potassium. I mean, the highest source of potassium and high in resistant starch, and uh, actually have like the highest satiety index mm. measured in studies. That uh, they say she did the fo- most. Is there so, rice? Rice is probably one of the highest. Rice, well, white rice is also yeah, like ninety something, ninety five. I mean, rice is less fiber than white potatoes, mm. so it's probably higher. Mm. Um, yeah. So eat potatoes <laughs> in moderation. Oh, there was a. I saw the seaweed word. So they also ate a lot of seaweed. Mm. Um. Probably actually got the DHA or the DHA from the seaweed as well. So they got a lot of omega three fatty acids. Um, mm. and probably a big because big source of the DHA is actually seaweed. That's where the fish get their mm. DHA from, yeah. and that's the brain healthy food. I mean, definitely, it's I think the number one brain food mm-hmm. is omega three fatty acids for mm. the brain. And this also shows the DHEA, the hormone differences between us and okinawans so uh, because the okinawans eat like a, this low color intake their natural dhea levels even in their youth are lower than the us but they maintain it for longer so they catch up or even they pass the us um, elderly people in their dhea levels compared to us so they probably eat more calories they get plenty of nutrients so their hormone levels are higher in their youth but they also age faster and uh, their drop off is faster mm. so they're gonna be lower in their hormone levels sooner than uh, Okinawans. Would be interesting to see this graph with the NAD levels. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the color restriction increases NAD levels, um, and obesity decreases it. So mm. it's probably like some, something similar. There was also the headline that the traditional Okinawan appears to be highly anti-inflammatory. Mm-hmm. So, because they ate so much of these bitter herbs and spices mm. that are anti-inflammatory yeah. and got the uh, DHA from the seaweed and the fish. So that's also very anti-inflammatory for the body. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what are your takeaways? Like what are you changing in your diet or if any based on this study? <laughs> well, mm-hmm. and my first idea was to make a sweet potato pie today. <laughs> <laughs> But I noticed that that was a traditional Okinawan sweet. Really? Yeah. So actually, you know, the food pyramid still had sweets on the top. Ah. So it's not like they didn't eat sweets. Mm-hmm. But their desserts were not donuts and cakes. Like in America, their dessert was, for example, the sweet potato pie. Mm-hmm. So it has like a very thin layer of something. I don't know what it's made of. Probably some starch or what they, tapioca starch or what they used at the time. Mm. And then a sweet potato layer. Mm. Nice. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'll, I'll report. Yes. Oh, good. Awesome. I hope uh, I, I've never tried that before. <laughs> But let's see. I'm going to use probably some non-traditional Okinawan ingredients for that, like lysine and trehalo, <laughs> <laughs> stevia. <laughs> cinnamon and... Yeah. Well, I guess I use cinnamon probably. But yeah, mm-hmm. I'm going to do some stevia, you know, low-carb version as well, or low-sugar version as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess here the key takeaways uh if you do calorie restricted diet you know if we think about the minnesota thing versus okinawan thing is that you need nutritional planning it's not that just like stop eating if you don't get your nutrients you're just gonna go into starvation you're gonna start losing muscle and tissue and Mm. you know neurotransmitters and everything so calorie restriction i think is good but it needs to be very well planned Mm. Another thing that I noticed from the studies is that they haven't done... Well, the Okinawans, of course, they probably ate that for their whole lives. Mm, In humans, there are less studies on this prolonged calorie restriction, especially if it's high. So the uh, Okinawan calorie restriction was very moderate, like 10%. Mm. Mm -hmm. So maybe that there is no need to do take calorie restriction in excess unless you want to lose weight. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, calorie, I guess, moderation is still important. And uh, especially if you're in a calorie surplus, then the quality of food matters more. Because I think if you're in a calorie deficit, um, from a, like the yeah, like the health side, your health will improve no matter what. But to do it long term, then you need yeah, like the good, good structure of it. Uh, like um, in calorie surplus then, uh, I mean, you can still, you know, live longer without calorie restriction if you do a lot of other things right. So if you have, like, some good exercise and you get all the uh, micronutrients and uh, balancing the methionine-glycine ratio. So that's because glycine supplementation has been also seen to uh, extend lifespan even without protein restriction. Mm. So, uh, yeah, like, it's not even that the protein restriction is important. It's the, like, methionine. Uh, so make sure, make sure that you don't get too much methionine is what apparently is more important uh, than protein restriction. And calorie restriction usually is a way to achieve protein restriction. And, uh, yeah, but, you know, it's also very hard to, let's say, build muscle with it. <laughs> mm. And so it's a uh, quality of life is definitely uh, reduced if you're under chronic calorie restriction, like you're cold and tired and uh, sarcopenic and that mm. kind of thing. So uh, obviously for optimal healthy aging, then you still need to have some muscle and strength as well. Mm. And uh, to uh, maintain the like longevity or to not age faster when you are eating like maintenance calories or in a small surplus is to get more glycine and not that much methionine so some methionine is still good so you need methionine mm. for like detoxification and methylation and uh, i think I, i even found that uh, like low methionine also like speeds up graying of hair uh, so your hair turn gray and lose color faster if you don't get enough uh, methionine <laughs> so mm. but but you know you need the methionine but not too much and uh, you need to counterbalance it with glycine and i think I think I saw Chris Master John's article about it, and he said that for every gram of meth or like uh, methionine depletes glycine. So every every gram of methionine you need about 0.5 to one gram of glycine. How much does 100 grams take? 
Pass uh, methionine. I don't know exactly, but I mean, it's very high. So like, I would imagine it has a, like a hundred gram steak mm. usually has maybe 30 grams or 25 grams of protein and probably like 10 grams of it is methionine. So you would need five grams of glycine. At least, yeah. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so yeah, definitely if you're and, a meat, I mean, meat eater. E- even, even besides that, even for the collagen and uh, skin benefits and other like glutathione benefits, you want at least 10 grams of glycine and probably more, mm-hmm. like 15 probably or something like that. Yeah. So macrodose the glycine. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, or eat jello and yeah, skin. Yeah, beef, beef gelatin, jello, yeah. and uh, don't eat that much like muscle meat. Yeah, and I guess you don't eat, need that much glycine if you don't eat that much red mm-hmm. meat. But um, yeah, like you need less glycine on like a plant based diet. Mm-hmm. You need more on a muscle meat diet, and. Uh, I mean, first of all, you don't need that much, like, BCAs or methionine either. You need, like, a certain amount. Mm. Um, Have you ever been on a low-protein diet? No. Well, I, I've done it, like, a few days of, like, a fasting mimicking diet. And I do have days where I eat, like, a, a lot less protein. Mm. So I, I have, like, some days where I eat only, like, a thousand calories and uh, maybe 70 or 60 grams protein. Mm. and uh that's like a fasting making that for me <laughs> that uh and the goal is to yeah like to uh, like to keep the mTOR lower and uh, increase autophagy and AMBK and those things so periodically it's good but you want to mm. do it like oh it depends on the situation uh, and your goals like I do it maybe a few times a month so mm. three times a month maybe once a week of having like a low protein day and a very low calorie day is also good for anti-aging. Um, so, I mean, the alternative is to do like a strict fast, like a 48 hour, 30, uh, 72 hour fast, or be on a low protein diet for a few days. Mm. And you pretty much get the same benefits. Like the Walter Longo's fasting mimicking diet is based on that. So that you don't do like an extended fast of zero calories. You eat like 500 to 800 calories of plant-based foods that keep the mTOR and IGF-1 lower and mimic the effects of fasting. So I think that's... Um, that is a, like a real biohack in a sense that you trick your body into thinking that it's fasting mm-hmm. you know, while while still eating some food. Yeah, and I think that is definitely like a good longevity thing. And it's good for those people who just get get stressed about not eating. Yes, like it's also there is also the mental mental component. Um, especially women might might get a little bit uh, distressed about it, and they just need to you know have the structure of eating. Mm. But also for women, I mean, these things get way more complicated than mm. for men yes. because we are very cyclical and we do definitely need more protein or our body is better at protein oxidation and fat oxidation at the luteal phase. Mm-hmm. And in the follicular, the first two weeks of the cycle, we are more insulin sensitive. We do better with higher amounts of carbs. We need mm. that for to boost the serotonin and everything like that. So for women, these kind of like uh, heuristics don't mm. really work that well yeah yeah, yeah I, I agree and the well, caloric needs like i wouldn't do strict calorie restriction at the first two, uh, last two weeks mm-hmm. of the menstrual cycle um you're also going to lose iron and vitamins and water and everything you know in the beginning of the cycle so that's why you kind of want to prepare for that mm. and then you know near the ovulation maybe you don't want to do strict calorie restriction because your body starts to think that you're in uh, starvation, especially if you're not getting the nutrients and you may lose your ovulation. So it mm. affects your fertility mm. immediately yeah. if you do it wrong. So again, just like a planning a little bit. I think women need to plan a bit more. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like chronic calorie restriction and low calorie intake eventually will downregulate for men as well, the hormones mm. and testosterone levels. Um uh, but I guess the like, threshold for that is a bit... They can get away with more and they can stay in the color restriction a bit longer. Uh, and they can probably recover faster as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think it goes back to like finding a balance of you know cycling your calories, cycling your carbs, cycling your protein, cycling your... Uh, yeah, the uh, like nutrient uh, stress that you get from your diet. Mm. 
Mm. And, and like uh, listening, not being gonna like not being gonna like modern, uh, <laughs> high calorie uh, processed food uh, diet. Yeah, I think that's that actually the most important thing is just like avoiding the processed foods, like all the traditional diets before, and all of Mediterranean diet, mind diet, healthy diets are pretty much based on real whole foods. Mm. And the composition changes, but you know none of these healthy diets includes donuts or pizza or seed oils or right they don't include the like the yeah the modern mm. bread and modern pizzas are refined grains yeah but they do have like you know breads they do have some yeah some like traditional pastas or pizzas and those things so like well that there's was the a, time there's... when they used the whole like the yeah. thing Seed. yeah they didn't just peel it off and yeah the refined it. refined grains are the ones uh, that cause the biggest insulin spike and uh, least nutrients but yeah like a whole food bread sourdough bread is probably still fine it's very traditional mm. and uh yeah, they add sugar nowadays to the bread as well. Mm. <laughs> oh, and that's another good point that you just said, the insulin. Like mm. the Okinawan diet was very low low in uh, glycemic index. It probably didn't include that much insulin spikes. Yeah. And there is a, a, the brain insulin resistance and the peripheral and central insulin resistance is whole another topic, which is like a huge impact on brain aging and the body aging. And they are very like linked. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. You want to you want to keep both the body and the brain insulin sensitive. Yeah, that's right. But uh, we can do another show about that mm-hmm. another time, and we'll start wrapping up this very interesting paper. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the full chapter and the full book mm. about it. Um, is there anything else you want to mention before we uh, stop here? So yeah, we've been talking so much about collagen in this episode that I just thought to brought up a, a very good collagen because we have tested a lot of different types of collagen mm. and everyone is, you know, that the discussion is, is it supposed to be marine collagen or eggshell or bovine or grass fed or whatever? What type is the best if you want to do this or that? So I recently uh, stumbled upon this um in cacao (laughs) yeah i don't like it because it has my name in it it's just actually very good collagen because it does have it's a collagen complex that has bovine marine uh, eggshell oh damn it's in in germany so i don't actually know how to kraken (laughs) kraken (laughs) Kraken collagen um it has vitamin c hyaluronic acid elastin some sort of vanilla pieces and uh, the camembert or com- I don't know how to pronounce it that's the sweetener here so it has five different types of collagen and mm. its molecular weight apparently it's medical grade mm-hmm. uh, compared to most of the collagens in the market which are non-medical grade so mm. they are less absorbed so yeah I contacted them to ask to partner with them because I just yeah, I found this to be the best collagen that I've used. I also like their spreads and they have nice products, yes, uh, fun- they, functional products. They actually sent me for my birthday, they sent me chocolates that had like my quotes <laughs> inside, like a card of my quotes. So they have these nice chocolates, different flavors, dark chocolates, uh, very high in. And, uh, oh, who's been eating? Uh, I wonder who. And <laughs> they have like this quote cards inside of like my picture and like my twitter quotes that i've said this one says stress can either bring out the worst or the best in people so that's my (laughs) nice little interesting touch to it let's take another one for example and it tastes pretty good Um, and as you can see i've been eating them a bit yes totally it has been seen (laughs) <laughs> uh, you can choose to be addicted to things that lift you up or addictions that drag you down uh, and, uh, the chocolate addiction lifts you up <laughs> right <laughs> it lifts my uh, it inhibits my myostatin and it helps up. helps me to boost my antioxidant defense so it lifts me up a yes. lot they also add like stuff like collagen and those kind of things to this chocolate 
Yes. So uh, you have a code. Yeah. So I have a code. It's Inca Ka with I and K A C A O. Is your code Inca yes. Ka? Yeah. And Inca the website Ka, is with uh, Inca a C. space Ka. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can put a link. Yes. Yeah, and you can find it on my Instagram as well. So if you want it a little bit cheaper, then use that code. And um, another thing that I have an update is that I'm. I've been recording podcast episodes for this year, pretty much, but there has been a lot um, mm-hmm. that we've done, like got married and things mm-hmm. like that. So, yeah, uh, I finally got back into that project and I'm going to launch it uh, probably next week. Nice. So it's going to be very interesting. Like I have had the privilege to interview pretty cool people in that, in mind and psychology, that's the topic. So if those topics are interesting to you, go to my Instagram or newsletter and you can get the notification when I launch it. Yeah, it's the Mind and Psychology podcast. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to be on it. So yes. we will share it together. <laughs> All right. That was it for the episode and hope you enjoyed it. We definitely did. Uh, stay tuned for the next one, next talk show. And uh, If there are yeah. any specific topics that like mm. you would like us to talk about then just uh, put it in the comments and uh, we'll look into those things where can people find your social media i'm in instagram at inca land with two eyes e e um, i i and wait i i n k land yes i'm not good at spelling it in this <laughs> i i n k land mm-hmm. yes and on uh, seamland stay the next watching this episode stay tuned for the next one Stay empowered.